for now we both. All right. I should be allowed to, re to record now if, you, if anybody is not uh, able to right now and uh, needs to just let me know. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just, uh, well, first of all, we just want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us today for the, uh, 2020 Sanford basketball media day. We'll start off with, uh, with the women's team. We'll have head coach Carly Coons <laughs> followed by uh, seniors, Natalie Armstrong and Raven Omar. Um, we'll start off uh, with, uh, like I said, with coach Coons. She's entering her second year at Sanford after three years as the, um, as, as the head coach of Valdosta State in her first season last year, she led the program to its first ever Southern Conference regular season championship and third SoCon tournament championship. Um, coach, if you could just start us off with, with your thoughts heading into the season and then we'll open up for questions. Yeah, we're um, obviously really excited now that we're in single digits. We've hit single digits to game day, so you can tell that there's no excitement at all, that there's not a countdown going on. Um, but yeah, we... Um, you know, kind of basically have somewhat of an entire new team from last year. So, you know, you feel kind of like you have momentum going into a year or two, but we're kind of feeling like we're starting back over a little bit with, with an entire, you know, six new players, lost eight from last season, um, but also a really solid core coming back. Um, obviously, the, the returning leading scorer in the conference um, is nice to have back on your team. Um, but more than anything, we're just excited after everything that's happened for an opportunity to compete. You know, there's been a lot of people that have worked countless hours um, to make this happen for us. And we're, we're, th we're thrilled for the opportunity to, to get a chance to compete. I got a question. Joey, is uh, it just me or is the sh signal a little shaky? I, I think it's fine. The signal. Can you hear me? Open that door. Coach, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear I you. Can I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. All right. So I'm looking at the schedule. It uh, looks like you got a, a t two big ones to start off the season. Tell me a little bit about that. And that's really got to test your players early on to see exactly what you got early on in the season. Yeah. You know, this was not our original schedule. Um, Obviously, things happen. We had some cancellations take place, and we traded games like Presbyterian and Murray for games like Alabama and Auburn and Indiana. Um, but more so than any, you know, I really wanted the opportunity for this team to be challenged in the non-conference and to really face as much as adversity as possible. Um, and, you know, while we might not maybe see as many wins in the win column, there will be major takeaways from all those games, and, and hopefully we won't have faced anything um, – we won't have faced anything in, in preparation for this conference season. We will, we hopefully will have seen everything, every type of athleticism, every type of um, offense, every type of defense. And, and that's why you play the non-conference. And so um, I think it's going to be a challenge, but it's also going to be fun. We get to go play at some really cool places and against some really good players. I got a question coach. coach. All right. We talked about your pace of play last year, averaging 66.2 points per game. Just talk about how fast you want to play. And do you want to see that number rise? Do you want to see it fall? What kind of pace and tempo are you going to play with this year? Yeah, I, um, we will definitely play faster than we played last year. And, you know, for our ability to, to, you know, to score that many points in a transition year, I thought was, I was really proud of our team. You know, I took over a team that ran a pretty slow methodical Princeton offense and we tried to push that pace and, and, you know, now we've got two point guards who have a little bit more speed to them than Charity, our point guard last year, you know, no knock on her, but that sh they just play very different. And that's already increased our pace and already increased our, like you said, pace of play. We're, we're going to be a team that really wants to get out and push the ball in transition. And I've already noticed that here in the preseason um, and practice in our scrimmages of, of, of our team playing faster and, and getting us into our transition quicker. So I would expect hopefully that number um, if we're hitting shots to, to rise. How did the success of last year help propel you into this season? I think in a number of ways. How much you know, did that for, help your Yeah, it, 
it helped a lot. For one, it just gave us credibility with our team. You know, it's like you can't say, you know, you can't say the things that we're doing don't work. And so I think just from a credibility standpoint and from a respect standpoint from our players, um, that's obviously helped. It's helped with recruiting. Um, it, it's helped set the culture and still set the standard for what the expectation is here. So, um, you know, going into practice, these players you know, know what to expect and know honestly what it takes to get get it done. And so I do feel like we're already further ahead of where we are this year compared to where we were last year at this point in our season going into games, just because that culture, you know, is set and that standard is set and um, it, it, it has really helped. Maybe we set the bar a little too high. I think there's going to be some expectations here at Sanford, like the coaches rag on me, Carly, what have you done to yourself? You know, people are going to expect you to do this every year. Um, but a lot of people don't ever have an opportunity to compete for a championship. So we were really fortunate. What is, uh, we talked, uh, I talked with Bucky last week and he was talking about his experience coming into his first year, but this year in general is just unique. He said he had three players go down early on and he saw, said that it was the three players he wouldn't expect that don't go out, they stay in. How has it been for your team with COVID and everything? And, you know, with cases spiking here in Alabama, you're playing an indoor sport. Are you worried? How has it been the, the, the journey so far? Yeah, it is really interesting. I think our word we use a lot is that we have to remain flexible with everything. Um, every player pretty much has to be ready to play, you know, there's going to be no seven, eight, nine on the bench anymore. Those kids have got to be ready and prepared to, to have to step on the floor and play. And we focus on that a lot in practice. Sometimes those kids maybe wouldn't get as many reps. Those, those maybe, you know, 13, 14, 15 members on your bench. But, you know, if – at any given time, three or four players go down. Those players have to be ready to play. Um, so we, we've done, we've, you know, paid some attention to that a little bit this season, but I also try not to put too much attention on it um, and too much focus where we're talking about it every single day because it's already looming enough and it's already, there's so much anxiety. I mean, we get tested now three times a week and walking into those tests, I'm telling you, like my, my armpits sweat every time. Um, but <laughs> I, we do at the end of practice, my phrase is wear your mask, wash your hands, and then we clap twice. Um, so we, we try to do our part and, and stay safe and healthy and, and just remain extremely flexible because it, it, it's been, it's been crazy and how, how, however changing this thing is. And, you know, one day you think it's one thing and then the next day it's something totally different. Um, so we are trying to remain as flexible as possible and just hoping for the opportunity to, to compete. Any, uh, any further questions for Coach Coons? Yeah, uh, Joey, can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Uh, hey, co uh, Coach? I see you, Joey, but that's okay. Um, for Coach? I can see you. Uh, there you go. Um, first of all, I got some arid extra dry in my uh, daughter's room for your armpits. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but yeah. more importantly, I, I think we all still, um, as media members, we always look back before we move, move ahead. At one point, at what point rather, what game, what point last year, was it a practice, was it a game, uh, did you stop becoming the Cinderella story? You were picked seventh or eighth, you were the brand new coach on the block, and all of a sudden you became tournament champions uh, and regular season champions, and you were coach of the year, let's uh, applaud that as well. So, but there had to be a point where you're looking back and going, you know, maybe we're not a Cinderella. Maybe we are this good. Was there a game, a practice or an event where you felt and you thought, you know what, we can compete? Well, I think, I think in some of our non-conference games, we started to get a sense where this team's a lot better than they think they are. You know, when we played some of the, the opponents that they had faced the last year, like in, in Troy and in UAB, um, where they had faced 30 point deficits and in both of those games we had opportunities to hit shots to win the game I think the team walked away thinking okay you know what what's going on here there's something different um and then that continued to happen and then you know we went to UNA um and that was a team that that is was picked very high in their league we and honestly going into their conference we were the only non-BCS team to beat them and walking away from that game because I knew how good that team was they didn't um but I thought, okay, we, you know, if we can continue to get them to buy in, um, this is going to be a team that can that compete. And then, honestly, our, we went on the road our first conference game and won double figures at Wofford. And I think the light bulb went off for all of them probably after that first conference game of, 
okay, you know, we, we've got some mojo now, we've got some confidence. Um, we, everyone kind of knew their roles and then it kind of went rolling there. Um, so I would probably say if there was one game, it would probably have been that first conference game at Walford where the light bulb truly went off and everything was starting to come together at the right time. And, um, but, but it was just, it was a fun season to watch, you know, them grow. And I know you got to witness it, just watching them grow from that first game all the way through to where we were truly playing our best basketball, our best team basketball in that tournament. And that's what you want to see as a coach. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, coach, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for, for doing this. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Next up we'll have, uh, we'll have senior center Natalie Armstrong. This is the uh, Southern Conference tournament, most outstanding player last year and it's, it's preseason all conference uh, heading into this season. Natalie should be sitting down there. She is. All right. Um, we'll go. We'll go ahead and just uh, open it up for uh, for any questions that y'all might have for Natalie. Hey, Nat. Um, does it feel like at times that you just got on campus yesterday as a freshman? Did it go by quickly for you these four years, and have you enjoyed it? Definitely have enjoyed it. I would say, like, looking back on my whole experience, it flew by. Of course, there's some times where you're, like, stuck in the moment and things seem like they're going slow. But overall, definitely seems like I maybe have been here for one year. But it's crazy. I'm a senior now. And how much have, on the court, how much have you grown? Where has your game developed? Um, I think I definitely have had a lot of growth as a player. But I think like coming to Sanford, playing with Coach Morris, and then now with Coach Carly, I think it has been like the element of changing as far as the style of play we have. And definitely under Coach Carly, finding my groove and, you know, using my skills to the offense that we do run. Now, as, as an o older person now, as a senior upperclassman, you're going to have to carry the team on those broad shoulders that, that, person who led the the uh, conference and scoring and all of that other stuff uh have you looked in the mirror and and told yourself that you're no longer the freshman and now it's time for me to lead these new girls in you got eight new girls so Carly said I think definitely last year especially towards the end um towards conference play I kind of took upon myself to be more of a leader to step in that in that position at the end of last season but for sure this year, I mean, even coming before I returned back to campus, I was like, okay, I really like have to play that leadership role and do everything that it takes to be that for my team. I'm good. Thank you, Nat. How is, uh, how has this year been overall? Just to summarize it with everything that's happened as a, as an athlete and the question of, is it going to happen? Am I going to be able to play this year? How has that been on you as a senior? It's been crazy for sure. Um, I actually didn't get to come back with the team when they returned to campus. Over the summer, I did have COVID, and so I was late to returning. So definitely that um, integration back to practices and working out was tough. But I think overall, like now where we're at right now, single digits to our first game day, it's pretty encouraging because like when our season did get cut short, it was kind of like, will this all be over before our season? Like, will we, some conferences don't get to play until January? Like, how is our season going to look? And as of right now, we do get to play in nine days. So I think overall it has been tough, but super encouraging that we still, fingers crossed, get to have a great season. <laughs> Anything more for Natalie? Yeah, I'm going to ask her one more. I know the girls obviously calling their games. Um, we didn't ask Coach Carly, and I'm, I'm definitely not going to ask Raven the same thing. Describe that moment that was taken away from all of you um, to not be able to go to the NCAA tournament. I'm sure it's a feeling that you'll never forget. So for me, one, our team, well, majority of our team found out through Twitter. So that was pretty tough taking that in, you know, all being alone because we we're all still at home. But after the conference tournament, we were under the impression that we were just getting our, I think we had like three and a half days given to us for our spring break before we returned for practice. And so, you know, I was just at home trying to relax while I had my days off and then get ready to come back and grind for the tournament. So whenever we found out that 
of course it got canceled. It was really devastating, but also just encouraging. I know it was probably 10 times harder on our graduating class, but for me, it was like, all right, well, I have another year and another shot to go out and actually get to go to the tournament. Let me have you repeat that again. You found out through Twitter? Yes, sir. Interesting. <laughs> Thank God for social media. Yeah. <laughs> Anything further for Natalie? Thank you, Natalie. And Thank we'll, you. Uh, we'll move on to senior guard, Raven Omar. From, uh... Hello. We'll go hey, ahead. Raven, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I just finished with Natalie. Uh, you were conference tournament champs, regular season champs. So excited. It was a great moment. Uh, how did you find out that the season was canceled? And again, what were your personal feelings? Uh, it must have been a very difficult time to wrap your head around that thing. Yes, um, I found out actually um, in a, our team, I think it was Olivia. She um, sent a message to the group because she, I think she saw it on Twitter too. So I, again, uh, like I was just ready and prepared to come back after about three or four days. But when I found out when Liv sent in the group message, I immediately went to Twitter and all different forms in like online, uh, you know, Google everything just to figure out if it was true. And it was, yeah, it was heartbreaking just because like it was, we've made history as a program with winning the regular season um, title and the tournament title and just getting the opportunity to take um, take our chances at in the tournament with our eight seniors was something that we all looked forward to and were um, really excited about. So having it kind of ripped away from us was just, yeah. I mean, obviously devastating. You have said um, plenty of times the influence that charity had on you. Um, it's kind of interesting to watch the torch being passed, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and you can watch from the sidelines how coach managed that, how, how she managed knowing she's got to build for the future. So what did you learn from charity and how much, you know, can you, uh, parlay that into having the type of season and the type of career that she had? Well, first, I just want to say that I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to have Charity as a teammate, um, just because not only on the court was she a great athlete, but she was a great person to be around and a great person to learn different things um, from off the court as well. But as far as on the court and her passing the torch, uh, I definitely learned the importance of understanding um, my teammates individually and not just, you know, giving everybody the same treatment or not necessarily treatment, but handling situations the same with everyone. Everybody uh, receives information or criticism different, or, you know, right. you might receive a pass different than this person to so certain, you know, just different little details that you have to understand as a teammate. And especially at my position as a point guard uh, to have everybody be as successful as, successful as they can be. Um, also, I think Charity just was able to be a light that we needed as a team, uh, as a leader. And she was able to, you know, light a fire under everybody without it being necessarily a um, demeaning thing. It picked us up a lot of the time. And I think I took that away, uh, away from charity as well. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. Thank you. I asked your teammate this. What has this year been overall? I mean, it's definitely been something different. Not your normal off season, I'm sure. Tell me a little bit about that. Your teammate talking about how she actually had COVID. What has that been like to see your teammates go down and miss them for a few weeks or so and then have them come back and even stronger I'm sure yes um this year has been a roller coaster and of course it's going to continue to be a roller coaster just because obviously we don't know what's in store with COVID and it's you know things are always changing but I think that's the beauty of uh change and understanding that we can you know get through adversity and you know adjust and that's important to be able to do that um just seeing like Nat said she um she had COVID and she wasn't able to return with the team initially. It was definitely for me, for me specifically, just cause me and that are like really close. It was hard not having her, you know, coming in with the new girls and, you know, having um, that presence there for us to like get things rolling. And just, you know, just, we call each other Tom and Jerry, like she's a big girl, I'm a little girl. <laughs> it was just weird not having, you know, not having Tom there with me, but, um, I think she definitely came back a lot stronger and she bounced back very well 
she, uh, obviously that first day, I think she was struggling a little bit, but I mean, that was expected. But I think I think with COVID, we, we're, we've we all grown to be really strong and, you know, fight through adversity and are willing to accept adversity as well. So. Anything further for Raven? Thank you, Raven. No problem. Thank you. Thanks all for having me. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll have Coach McMillan in just a second. Joey, are the rings in that we've seen on social media? Do the girls have their rings yet? Yes. They, they got, their, uh, got their rings uh, last week, actually. Nice. So, got those in. Hold on just a second. Coaches towards right after, like talked about. Joey, just Okay, we have uh, men's head coach Bucky McMillan. Uh, uh, coach McMillan is entering his first season as our head coach after. 12 years as the head coach of Mountain Brook, where he won uh, five state uh, championships and played for seven. Uh, coach, if you could open us up with your thoughts heading into the season, and then we'll open up for questions. Yeah, well, first, thanks everybody for being here. You know, I know it's kind of a, been a weird time. It's good to see y'all's faces. Hey, it's not in person. Um, and our guys have been working really hard. We've been practicing. You know, we've had some guys who have been out quarantined, but the past two weeks, we've had everybody back together, and uh, we've made a lot of progress. You know, we've, we've the guys are kind of picking up on the system and, and made a lot of improvements, like I said, in the past 14 days. We had our first little inner squad scrimmage. We played a half with refs here and everything, and the halftime score was 78-76. So the good thing is these guys are learning how to play fast. So I think the style of play uh, um, will be really fun for the city and, and fun for our – we have a fun team to watch. Um, you know, I know this is a strange year where, you know, we've had games that have already been canceled that we're trying to fill in replacement games. And if we can get to the court, you know, I, I, I think everybody's going to enjoy watching these guys play. Um, you know, we have some guys that, that are some good players that had to sit out last year. You know, Myron Gordon's a very good player. He had to sit out last year. Uh, Preston Parks was a transfer had to sit out last year. These are all seniors. Um, KJ Davis had to sit out last year. And then Jalen Dupree was able to play last year. And he was a a good player, almost averaged a double-double for Sanford. Um, they brought in some good players. One of these guys you're going to talk to in a second, Richardson Matre, who was at Florida Atlantic last year. He's been the leader of our team. Um, he's been a joy to coach. Uh, A.J. Staten was a great player that we signed, the freshman who's got a chance to be the freshman of the year in the conference, I believe. Then D Jacob Tryon, who um, transferred from Portland to New Mex and then to us. He's a 6'11 guy who can really shoot the basketball. So we got some good pieces. You know, I know that we're picked eighth or ninth in the league of a 10 team league, but uh, and I think our team has a lot of potential when we get to the end of the season to make some noise. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping that uh, life can return to normal and, and basketball can be normal this year because I think it'll be a, a fun team to follow. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, open up for any questions from the media. Hey, Buck, you since we're in this we're in this COVID era, uh, how how important is is quality depth this year to make sure that everyone's ready to go at a moment's notice? Well, it's, it's such a great question. You know, I think it should be very important 
the problem is when the testing protocols are what they are with one person in your whole traveling party test positive, everybody's out. I don't know if death matters that or not because everybody's going to be gone, you know? Um, so that's strange. And we just had a game get our first exhibition game just got canceled. And so we're going to find a replacement here on November 25th. You know, they played a game, uh, the team would play, and it was an exhibition with Martin Methodist. And they played a game uh, on Saturday. And then on Sunday, none of their players tested positive, but one of the players from the team that they were playing tested positive. And so now Martin Methodist's whole team is quarantined with nobody who's a positive. So, you know, it, it's strange, you know, because it's kind of like all for one, one for all. If one has it, everybody's out, you know? So, you know, if it was like football, I would say depth would be very important because, you know, you could just quarantine the guys that have it or, that, or the guys that are in contact tracing. But I don't know if the NCAA is going to loosen up on the rules. I just don't know. I do think for basketball to have a relevant season, you know, I think some things are going to have to change, you know. Um, and if it does change, it's more like football, then depth is going to be imperative. What, what is that feeling? You haven't even started the season and already you got your first game. You're looking for reschedule. Is this just is this this kind of season it's going to be, do you think? And what a first year for you to, to kind uh, of experience it. Yeah, I know. We, we had that. We, we were scheduled to play Alabama State like our fifth game of the year. That got our fourth game of the year. They That got canceled. Uh, and, you know, we're finding replacements quickly. But, yeah, it's a strange year. You don't necessarily dream of, hey, I, I take a job in April to coach a college basketball team. I don't meet my players till August because everybody's in quarantine. Um, so it, it's a strange year. Everybody's dealing with, with so many wild circumstances. You know, the only thing we can control, and I tell our players, is you don't know what's going to happen. Like, you don't know if we're going to go into quarantine for 14 days. You know, so we got to make the most out of every practice. You got to assume, like, hey, at any point, you could be gone 14 days. Um, now, the good part is, like most college students, the virus has not affected, you know, our guys that have had it have very little symptoms. And so, so our health has been good, which is most important. Um, but, you know, I just hope life can return to normal. And I think we all do, um, particularly for these college kids where, you know, the virus have, it has impacted them very little. Um, them personally so but it, it's a heck of a season and, and you know it's kind of like these interviews when I get interviewed I'm all over the place because we really there's something new every day and knowing the unknown so we're talking about a season where there's so many unknown circumstances that you know it's hard to articulate exactly what to expect um, but I know we'll all look forward to when we can get out there and we can play Hey, Bucky, I've got a question. Um, obviously, you took the job back in April, and you said you're going to keep everything kind of the same, obviously adjusting the college rules and everything. What's that been like? How have the players progressed from that first practice and getting to meet your guys back in late July, August? How have they bought into the system, and are you pleased with the way they're playing in the full court and the half court and defensively? You know, they're, they're really good at playing fast. Like, they – that's one thing that oh, I would say has – been a positive that the team fits playing really fast. And so I, I wish we could get more stops in the half court, you know, and we're gonna have to continue to work on that. But, you know, like I mentioned, like, you know, our team was on pace to like 150 to, you know, 148 game the other day. And um, they enjoyed, and we got a lot of, we got a lot of guys that are capable of going for 20 at any night, on any night, you know? And so I think, it, I think that it's a fun way obviously to play, but, I think they really enjoy it because, you know, I mean, you know, the more possession, the, the more possessions, the more opportunities for everybody. So, you know, it, it's it, 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 the hardest thing to get people to do is to buy into playing hard every single possession, every second, you know, and that's kind of a, that's a talent that you acquire over time. And I can tell you, it's been a night and day different from when we got here into where we are now. And now we still got a long way to go, but if you would have told me we'd be where we are now, uh, two months ago, I'd be very pleased. William, didn't you go to Mountain Brook? Is that your point guard, your former point guard, William Galloway? <laughs> oh, trust me, I wasn't fast enough, strong enough, or athletic enough to play. I could only get the water and run the social media. That's why I am where I am. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that connection. Uh, Coach, I got a question. We talked about this on the conference uh, Zoom last week. Uh, your assistant coach, Coach Rebal, tell me about 
your relationship with him. What made you make the decision? I want this guy on my staff. And how cool is it to have him sitting next to you now on a guy who used to coach you when you were a player? Well, Coach Rebo was in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know, so there's all these coaches and there's some great coaches in the, around the state and around the country. But how many coaches have won two NAI national championships? You know, and then he took Birmingham Southern Division One in our first year, and they were co-conference champions. You know, he's he's the best. I don't know how to say it. Like I, I know there's some great coaches, but there's no one better than Coach Reball. And um, he's great because you know when, when I first talked to him about it, he was like, ah, I think I might want to. You know, I I don't. I, you know, am I too old? Can I can I I'm a bit of manage this? Then when he's in there, he's calling me at 2 a.m. Have you ever thought about doing this? You know, have you ever thought about doing this? He's up all night, 3 a.m. We're leaving the office, you know, last night at 1 a.m. So, you know, you can't slow him down. He's just so young at heart. But, you know, I played for the man. Um, you know, what makes Coach great is that he's such a genuine person, you know, and he just cares deeply for the people he's around. So he's a great basketball coach, but he's an even better person. But, you know, not just from the basketball standpoint, but just – selfishly my personal enjoyment I mean you know he's like a, a father figure and a best friend to me so I mean we just have and our whole staff's been great I mean we hate leaving the office I and mean, we're up here all we're up here all hours of the night we just we just hang out you know so he's been phenomenal and uh, I think the players really really love him any further questions for coach yeah I've got one Joey um Coach Bucky Ball, it's a neat slogan. It uh, it sells merchandise and gets people excited. But uh, for the for those of us who are not familiar with what you did at Mount Brook, uh, explain exactly what Bucky Ball will actually do and what it means. Good question. <laughs> and I think you know our our program's always been kind of surrounded by three things and that's that we're going to be we're going to work hard on everyone play hard on everybody you know that's what we call it. it's called being hard working okay and then we're going to be very unselfish our players are going to play for each other because you know just playing hard is not going to be good enough you have to play, play as hard as you can play and work harder than everybody and then you got to play together and then when you do that you kind of earn the right to play fearless you know, and play with massive confidence. You know, when you know that you're going out there and you've outworked your competition, you know you're going to play harder than your competition, and you know that you're going to go out there as a true unit, then you have a right to play fearless and play attacking basketball. So that's kind of been our slogan. Now, what it means for other people sometimes is we do play a little bit different. You know, we press on made shots, we press on missed shots, we run on made shots, we run on missed shots, we shoot a lot of threes, we mass sub, you know, we'll sub, you know, you know, we treat every possession like it's the last possession of the game. So, you know, if the ball goes out of bounds, you know, the first possession of the game and we're on defense, we're going to put our best defenders in there. You know, I've always said I never understood when you watch a basketball game and a team's, hey, they're down by three points and all of a sudden, hey, there's 10 seconds, let's put our five best three-point shooters in. Or, hey, we're, we're, we're up by one, let's put our best defenders in. So if it's good enough to do it the last possession of the game, why are we not doing it every possession of the game? And so I think that's what kind of makes it a little bit different and a little outside the box is that's how, you know, how I've always coached. Um, and that's kind of what we're, that's what we're going to do. And then the good part of it is since it's a lot of subbing um, and it's a lot of up-tempo with a lot of possessions, it, it's fan friendly, but it's also builds a camaraderie because at any point your name can be called. Anybody on that bench can be called we, to get in there and perform their task. You know, just because someone may not be a great offensive player or a great shooter, maybe he's just a great rebounder. Well, he may be, hey, this is the possession. We got to have that rebound, you know. And so we'll have guys, we'll have walk-ons that will go in there. And, you know, if they do something better than our starters, and that's what that situation calls for, you know, I don't care if it's the last possession of the game, we're going to put them in there. And um, it, 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 the accountability of practice because of that, um, you know, the guys are, know that they got to be ready to play. Arguably, the uh, the SoCon, and a lot of us have been able to watch it over the last decade or so, it's one of the top mid-majors. And you are going to be lined up against some incredibly talented teams and some great coaches. Uh, I mean, guys that certainly will be Power 5, as uh, ETSU's coach is now in a Power 5. I would assume, with your brand and, and your confidence, that you're looking forward to that challenge. Yeah, the SoCon, that's what people don't understand. Like some people don't know. 
the SoCon is an incredible basketball league. I mean, it's a top 12 league in the country. I think it's one of the best coach leagues in the country. You know, that's, that's no coincidence why you, like you mentioned, like why you see the next step for a lot of these coaches is a high major job. You know, and I told people this. I mean, Watford beat North Carolina two years in a row. ETSU last year went and won, beat LSU by 13 at LSU. Um, I mean, you could go right down the line. Greensboro's as good as anybody. Furman went to Alabama in Coleman Coliseum. They were favored in the game, you know? And um, so if you said, hey, let's put comparable teams in there, and you're talking about what if LSU, North Carolina, and, and Alabama was in our conference? People say, hey, well, you better be ready to play, you know? And that's kind of what we're talking about, you know? Um, it's just a great basketball league. And I think because the football – um, is competing at a different NCAA level that in a football country, people don't recognize that. But, you know, there's a reason why you look up. Davidson was in there. Davidson's going to the Sweet 16 with Steph Curry, who will be a top 50 player that's played basketball in the, in the NBA when they were in the league. Um, you got Watford's made runs. You know, it's a gauntlet of great teams. And anyone on any night can beat you. And that's what makes it so exciting. And it makes it so exciting for the city of Birmingham because we're going to have those high caliber teams coming into play in Birmingham every night. And for guys who love basketball, you know, not only is it great teams and not only is it teams who win, it's a great brand of basketball to watch because there's the teams are so well coached, you know, it's not just winning on talent alone. And so, um, you know, we're going to do our part to make Sanford and uh, to be a team to watch just like these other teams in the league. Thank you. Coach, I got a question. You said Alabama State's already rescheduled. How does that – how is that with December 9th? So, they, they had a, a an outbreak where, where they had their football and – they had a – I know they had a big concert down there, and a lot of their players got, got COVID from football and basketball. So, they're just going to play push your season back because they had their players were quarantined for two weeks. Then they got back to practice, and one of their coaches got it. So, now they're quarantined two more weeks, everybody. So they wouldn't be able to practice for almost a month. So they're going to push back and just play conference play is, you know, what we've been told from them. So they're going to not play any non-conference games. So you got that game and you got the 25th you're trying to reschedule now. Trying to, yeah, we just woke up to this one on the 25th, you know. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's really unfortunate, you know, it's, it's uh, because Martin Methodist may have zero cases of COVID. It's, and that's the deal. I don't, I don't know if the NCAA for basketball, if they're going to – are the protocols going to remain going to remain the same? Because if, if they remain the same, it's just going to be very difficult to find. Because if, if anybody in your party tests positive, right? So we got to take three COVID tests a week this week, right? All thirty people in our traveling party will test Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that's ninety tests. So if one person in there tests positive, our whole program fourteen days were shut down. All right. So then we got to find a team that we're playing where. No one in their program has tested positive. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, doing that multiple weeks in a row. So that's 90 this week, 90 next week. That's 180. So that means that's 360 COVID tests for the competition we're playing, and there can't be one positive. Hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's a challenge. And not only that, they can't contact trace somebody, you know, where they've contact traced somebody and they played somebody, for example, who might have had the virus. So it's going to be really interesting what the NCAA decides to do. But if there is not a change, it's going to be very difficult to find two programs where, you know, you pretty much win the lottery, you know, to, to be able to get out, there, get out there on the floor. Buck, I have one more question. How do you mark your progress as a coach? Uh, very successful 12-year high school career. In these past couple of months, what have you learned about yourself as a coach? And how have you seen yourself grow throughout the circumstances off the court, but growing and adjusting to the college game? You know, it's really strange. I've been asked that question, difference between high school and college. And, and this is going to sound really strange what I'm about to say. You, you had coaching college players, I've had to coach them more like seventh graders. Like meaning, I know we built something really special at Mountain Brook where we started at a young age. By the time we had the program built, you know, it was just, it was management mode kind of. Well, you know, you'd be surprised how many college players, the, um, the fundamentals that have to be retaught, you'd be surprised. 
And so I think that's the biggest thing I've learned is not coaching like a high school team. Like people are like, man, you got to have to step it up for coach more like, no, I've had to learn. I can dial it back. I coach it more like a JV team, you know, before we can then coach it like a high school team. And then maybe we can go to a college team because, you know, th that's the biggest change in the game I've seen since I played college basketball. And, you know, we played in the Big South, which is, you know, Division One league where I played, played at Birmingham Southern. And so even though I didn't have college experience as a coach, you know, I, I I, I did as a point guard. And so the, the biggest change I've seen since I've stopped playing in 2006 is the, the lack of attention to detail that you see in a lot of the college game. And I think, you know, we were fortunate to build something unique at, at Mountain Brook High School where we put that detail in the players at a young age. So now it, I think that if we can get the attention to detail that we had, like we did in high school, I think we'll be at, uh, it'll be very beneficial because there's simply not a lot of teams that foc focus on detail a lot. Um, fortunately for the league to make it a great league and unfortunately for the, the teams that, that, they're, that are in the league, that it's your competition, the SOCON, most of the teams are on the upper end of attention to detail. They usually have players that are really focused on detail. Um, and so, but I think that's why you see a Watford beat a high major, why you see a ETSU beat a high major and you can go right down the line because they really focus on detail. So that's been my biggest adjustment is actually, I came in here maybe under the pretense, like when I was in college, this is where it was. We can really kind of go a step past high school where it's actually the complete opposite. I got to go back and treat them like, hey, they, they, don't, they don't know how to pivot necessarily. They don't know how to jump stop. They don't know how to do all these small things. And so once we kind of realize that we've made a lot of strides. Hey Bucky, considering all the issues that you know, college basketball is having with COVID right now. Uh, Rick Pitino had suggested maybe pushing the season back. Uh, do you think that will be helpful to make it a later start than November 25th? See, the only reason I would go with that would be if they said the protocols were going to change. If they said, if we push the season back, we're going to change the protocols where they're not as stringent. Because if not, I think it would be a mistake to push the season back. And here's why. I think that it would be better if the protocols are going to be the same to actually have pushed the season up. And the reason I say that is now you have more flexibility. So like now a team is canceled. Now we're sitting here and we got a week to try to find a game. Well, if the season's pushed back, well, now, you know, you have a less of a time frame to manage your season. Maybe we can't play this game on November 25th, but now we have a longer time frame to plug a game in. Whereas let's say we push everything back and it's still the same uh, window to schedule games. Inevitably, if the protocols are the same, there's going to be games canceled. You're not going to be able to fit them in. So I wish we had a bigger window, is what I wish, to try to squeeze some of these games in. You know, um, unless, like I said, the protocols are going to change and, you know, the protocols have been more like football. Hey, this guy has the virus. We contact traced him. And, you know, it, it's not, we're not going to take out the whole team. He seems to be around his roommate. Um, and so those, these two will be out. Unless we're going to go to something more like that or a vaccines in play where, where you know, the, the, the circumstances are going to be different. I don't, I don't see a reason why pushing the season back would help. Yeah, I think Rick was talking maybe even doing the NCAA tournament in May. Mm -hmm. So the window would still be the same, but it'd be like a January to May season. Well, you know, I wouldn't mind, you know, just if they're trying to get it in, I wouldn't mind a November to May season because you're going to need that big window, you know? Um, you know, so it, it's a tough deal. And, and listen, I, you know, obviously Coach Patino has been around longer than I have, but, you know, I don't think anyone has answers, you know? I mean, you look at it, I don't think, you know, when you're looking at the president of the United States to the basketball coaches to ever, I mean, no one has the answer. This is just uncharted times. But I do will say this, for these college students, we have had very, and I think most, have had very little effect from the virus, you know, in terms of their affecting them. I'm not saying, you know, a parent may not have been affected or, you know, I, I, fortunately ours have not. But we've had, the ones that have had it have been pretty much symptom free. It's been, it has been milder than the flu for these guys. So, and I think talking to most coaches, that's been the case. So, you know, that's, we've been fortunate there. And, and if that's the common, if that's common everywhere, um, you know, that's a good sign for these college kids. 
Hey, Bucky, it's Joe. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, how are you managing your bubble, and how are you going to deal with the holidays with your players coming up? Great question. Um, so with our bubble right now, it's out, now we're going to three times a week of testing. You know, we encourage all these guys to, you know, now, now you're telling college kids, you're telling 18, 19-year-olds, you know, we can't lock them in rooms. Hey, to obviously be careful. We, we told these guys, hey, to uh, do certain things, you know, to saline spray at night and do different things to try to, you know, avoid contracting the virus, obviously. We're going to keep our guys here on Thanksgiving. We're going to keep them here. We're going to let them go home for Christmas, which is, you know, it's a four-day window there. But we're going home the 21st. We're coming back the 26th. And we start conference play, I believe, the 30th, I believe. Um, but we're going to let them go home for Christmas. You know, it's, it's very tough because we've had players who are not the guys who like to go out, who are the guys who kind of been in their rooms, contract the virus. And then we've had some of you told me, which players do you think are going to definitely get this virus? Not get it at all. So it's been the strangest thing I've ever seen because some of these guys that are, you know, hermit crabs in their room, They've, they've got the virus. And then you got some of these guys that, you know, are on Boys Gone Wild. They, they, they've been fine. So I don't know the answer. You know, I don't, I don't know the answer um, what's what. But I do know this. For college kids who've been here since uh, August, it's tough for me to tell them they can't go home and see their family over Christmas. That's just tough because we could – if they move the season back, you know, they, they could go a year without getting it, being able to go home. And so it's just a risk we're, gonna, we're going to take. Yeah, that is tough. Um, so you said you had 78 to 77 in the uh, inner squad game. How many um, possessions are you, are you trying to have in the college basketball game? Yeah, so we have 78, 76 and a half. So it's a half of a basketball game. Um, right. But – you know, I think the average possessions per team right now is at 70, you know. And, you know, it's all based on effective pace of play. So, for example, if you played – if Sanford played Sanford, you know, then there's going to obviously be more possessions. If Sanford played Virginia, who likes to slow it down, there's going to be less possessions. But maybe a typical game of Virginia has 61 possessions in a game. So if we played for Virginia and there were 75 possessions a game, even though that college average is 70, that means that, hey, you play pretty dang fast, even though it wouldn't appear that way. So some of it's relative to your competition. But I do know this, that I want to be, I want to have more possessions than anyone in the country. I want to be a top team in the country with possessions played and points. I really wanted, I want that to be Sanford. I want us to play that style of basketball. It helps with recruiting. It helps with improvement. I think, um, you know, uh, Nate did a good job at Alabama. They played, and we played in different ways. We, we try to turn up the tempo defensively to force um, possessions. But one thing I think you saw, Nate had a really good recruiting class at Alabama this year. And I think a lot of that had to do with the way that they played last year, you know, um, that is a fun style of play. And people and players can see themselves playing in that style. You look at uh, Bruce, Coach Pearl at Auburn. Like, you know, he plays a fun style of play. And it's not a coincidence those guys have, have got more and more players. It's just like a quarterback, you know, right now playing at Alabama football and they're throwing that thing all over the field. You know, it helps get the next quarterback. So we want to play an up and down game where it's fan friendly and we can rally the state around us. And good players see that and say, you know, I could go there and, you know, I could win 105 to 103 as opposed to 57 to 55, which means this many more points potentially, this many more assists, this many more rebounds. Um, and so that's kind of our mindset. Any further questions for Coach? All right. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, hey, thanks for covering, guys. We appreciate, you, appreciate you guys. We'll have, uh, in just a minute, we'll have our, uh, our last uh, person to speak, uh, Richardson Matre, a uh, senior transfer from uh, Florida Atlantic.
Okay, we're uh, we're now joined by senior guard uh, Richardson Matre, a transfer from Florida Atlantic. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, open up for any questions uh, you have for him. How you doing, man? I got a quick one for you. Um, how, how has it been with Coach Rebo and uh, Coach McMillan? Uh, obviously, they have a good history together. What has that relationship been like, and what have you seen on them on the practice court? Did they kind of complement each other well? Um, yeah. They bring they bring something that um me personally as a player I haven't seen before. Just you know their knowledge for uh, the game is just on a whole nother level. Um, the value they bring to the team in terms of you know uh, expertise and you know um, previous experiences helped me a lot. And me playing um the point, um, Coach Rebo and Coach Bucky was a point guard once upon a time. So you know it definitely helped me a lot you know, with my reads and um, how to get my teammates involved and um, how to run the team as well. Talk about that little inter-squad game you had where it was 78-76 at half. 